Hello everyone, hopefully we are live. Welcome to our first live speaker event for the Creatathon. So if you missed it, this week is the Creatathon and this is a readathon that I host with Monica. Hi! <laughs> Um, and this readathon is to celebrate Korean stories, and we have some very exciting guests today. So we have two authors who happen to be some of my favourites, Mary H.K. Choi. Hi. <laughs> and Kat Cho. Hi. And today we're going to be discussing contemporary Korean stories and the diaspora Korean experience. So Monica and I have prepared some questions that we're going to ask, but at the end, there's also going to be some time for you guys watching to ask some questions. Um, but yeah, let's start with some introductions. Mary, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. So my name is Mary, as you know. Um, yeah, I'm based in New York. I'm an author. I am the author of three books, uh, Emergency Contact, Permanent Record, and Yoke. Um, yeah, I live in New York and that's pretty much the extent of it. No, that that that, that encapsulates my entire being. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we'll start there, and we'll we'll go on from there. Okay. <laughs> um. Oh, should I just go? Yeah. <laughs> I was waiting to be called on, like we're in class. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Please acknowledge me. No. Uh, hi, I'm Kat Cho, author of. Um, I I write contemporary fantasy as well as now contemporary rom-com. Um, Wicked Fox and Vicious Spirits is my debut duology. And then that little guy, what, how do I do this? Once Prada came from is coming out in May. Um, yeah. And I, that's about about it. Just like Mary, I only exist for writing books. <laughs> I was born as a fully realized adult <laughs> to write YA. Totally. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, so we're going to have a fun, like, just chill warm-up question before we get into the nitty-gritty. So what is your favourite Korean story? It could be, like, a film, book, show, anything. Or just, if you can't choose a favourite, just one of them. <laughs> I love how much, like, Korean folklore there is, where just, like, women, like, bears turn into women because they don't eat anything but garlic. It's just, like, very confusing. And oftentimes, like, a lot of those, like, myths are filtered through like my parents who are like immigrants and too busy to actually tell me a story so it's almost like it's like hearsay yeah. <laughs> and so I really feel like if I ever like cross-referenced or like vetted the versions of the mythologies I have in my brain everyone would be like that's totally wrong but like I like any story that has to do with animals like nefarious foxes with like nine tails perhaps yeah. <laughs> Like tigers, all that stuff. What about what about you, Kat? Like mythology wise, I do. I will actually it's really interesting to me because there's some myths that I heard that are like apparently from like Jeju, right? Like Jeju Do. And then I heard a completely different myth of this the origin of the same exact thing that's like from Seoul. And I realized that like there's differences between the regions, which I kind of like actually. Um I think it's kind of like cool that we have we have retained like all of the different versions of these myths um, because like it's so easy to lose things that were like started as like oral tradition um, and weren't like really written down for a long time. So I, I love that. And obviously since I write like fantasy that often finds inspiration from mythology, like there's so much for me to be inspired by. Um, but yeah, I like how the much older ones are actually much more matriarchal. Mm -hmm. than more recent ones. Um, I think that's really cool because there's like a lot of like goddesses. Like there's like speaking of like Jejudo, there's like a the there's a story of like a, a goddess is the one like who created like the oceans and the islands and mountains and stuff. And I was like, yeah, she did. That's great. That tracks, right? Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. Like yeah. in terms of like yeah. actually getting things done. Like if you like look yeah. at like <laughs> historically, <laughs> like objectively, like like empirically that makes sense yeah but yeah that's awesome. for sure I mean well also if you like go back before Joseon like there were like full-on empresses who like ruled up by themselves like which which is really cool and and I think my cousin is the one who like pointed out to me she did like East Asian studies in college she was like actually yeah before Confucianism came in and confused us all like women did cool stuff like and had more autonomy 
how do you like find record of a lot of these mythologies only because like sometimes it's so interesting like what kind of gets filtered to us as people mm-hmm. who are like living other places it's almost like the like every version of it I'm like citation needed or like this feels like Wik- <laughs> Wikipedia-ish like how do you do a lot of your research or is it like oral tradition you talk to a lot of family members and stuff I stumbled on it kind of um I it wasn't on purpose that I found uh primary f- source materials but I have shamans like mudang in vicious spirits. And it's through them that a lot of mythologies like got retained because of the songs that they sing and the dances that they do are often just based on old folklore. So I bought a bunch of, and, and I was like ornery. Like I was like, I don't want like a book written by like a non-Korean. I want to find a Korean source material. Like it can be in translation. That's fine. But the original author has to have been Korean. Um, And I'm also lucky because my grandparents were professors. So there's like old, old, old books that like were in storage. So I found a lot of books that were like songs of the shamans and shaman like traditions and blah, blah, blah. And just peppered within there is like the most famous dance is the one about like Shimchong or whatever, you know? And um, and I found out like that a lot of these mythologies that we like read in maybe like a picture book off like whatever actually has like deep history. So that was really cool for me. That's really interesting. And also like, I totally believe you that pre Confucius, like maybe like, I feel like filial piety is like such a propaganda machine. Like even (sighs) someone like Mm -hmm. Xim Chong, which is like this person who's like very like, if you don't, if people don't know, like very like, like admired because she's like so good to her father who is Mm -hmm. this like useless drunk. And like, I don't know, like, I bet there are versions of that where it's, well, I would hope that there's a version of it somewhere where she's just like, you know what? <laughs> I'm done here. <laughs> I'm going to detach with love. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to throw myself in the ocean for me. Like, <laughs> I'm doing me right now. <laughs> Honestly, though, I mean, there's versions that are like slightly less like she was forced into it and more like she chose that path because of mm. love and family, which is is a nicer way to put it. Yeah, yeah. totally. You were like consent. Yeah. <laughs> or like, I mean, it's, I mean, and also I think like it is fair. Sorry that also, by the way, this is only the first question for going off this video. <laughs> no, I love but, it. Um, Please. I do think it would be like, if I think of it from a lens of like, it, if Shim Chung truly believes in, in the gods, she like, be- she has faith that they exist and that she's not actually sacrificing herself. She is actually going to the realm of the sea god and she's not going to die, like, she truly believes in this, then it's less like, ah, I'm willing to kill myself for this patriarchal society, and more like, I'm willing to do what I need to do for my beliefs. And if that's the case, if that's the lens you look at it, then I like that better um, in terms of autonomy. (laughs) No, same, same. And I think it's, like, kind of incumbent upon us, like, people like us to um just like really central like center that and like ignore <laughs> the other version <laughs> yeah yeah that's our power right as storytellers <laughs> totally. or question tell. two <laughs> yeah <laughs> next question please <laughs> well jumping off of the sort of idea of, of stories that we love um are th- was there a time when um during your sort of reading journey that you found a book where like you're like you had that moment where like, oh yeah, this is like the first time I've seen myself like represented in a story. Cause I feel like I can remember that exact moment of like, yeah. oh wait, <laughs> this is this is reflecting me or my family. Um, do, you, do you remember a moment like that? Kat, would you like to begin? <laughs> <laughs> it's, this is an interesting question because I do think for me, there's layers to it. Because I grew up in central Florida there wasn't a huge Korean population, let alone an, a huge Asian population, right? Mm-hmm. So, and and it's it's I have an interesting relationship with the term Asian American, because even though I understand why we use it, because you know, in order to have any like um, like I guess political clout, right? We need to have numbers and we need to band together and we need to raise our voice together. Um, So I'm not against that as an umbrella term, but I also think that like, there's a huge difference between me, a Korean under the umbrella of Asian American and my friend who's like a Muslim South Asian, right? 
Like it is huge difference. And so well, growing up though, I didn't realize that I just wanted to see someone who looks like me. So I clomped onto anyone who had a- Asian features. So like the yellow Power Ranger, you know, or Claudia <laughs> Kishi, um, things like that. And and it wasn't until I grew older that I understood like that I deserved someone who was more in line with my Korean identity as well. Like I shouldn't just accept like they are Asian in general. So I did, I did feel seen in a lot of ways with Claudia from Babysitter's Club with the Yellow Ranger. I did. And, and that was meaningful and it was important for me. And I'm happy that I grew up with them. But upon getting older and realizing that my Korean identity was unique in and of itself, even from other Asian identities, um, I didn't really find a, a piece of media that made me feel that way outside of Korean language, Korean dramas, right? Which mm-hmm. felt different, right? Um, Cause I had to like go to the, you know, Korean, Korean grocery store and get those VHSs and <laughs> go to, it, it, that was another land, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I'll say that um, I'll say that seeing John Cho in Hail to Kumar be Korean without having to explain that he was Korean was cool. Yeah. And then also book wise, Ellen O's fantasy series was pretty much the first time I saw a Korean fantasy published by a major publisher that was unapologetically Korean. Um, and that was like really important for me for my writing journey. Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like this, this question too, like actually really ends up revealing more than I'd care to regarding my own age, because like, that's the thing. It's like, you know, it's almost like that thing. And I've said this before where like, you can read words that have no vowels, like what your brain is like willing to fill in for you is kind of, you know, both a bomb and then just kind of like self preservation in a, a lot of ways like I'm not like you know I I too like saw Claudia Kishi and I was just like oh my god and their grandma Mimi lives with them their grandmother lives with them like that multi-generational thing feels real to me um the fact that her parents have this expectation of her that feels re- real to me and it is true you know that whole Asian American thing it's like ridiculous like Jay Caspi and Kang who's a, a writer for the New York Times and an author and a podcast host he he always talks about this like this notion of like the Asian American totality, this, this, like <laughs> this presumption that we're like sitting around being Asian American, like sitting, <laughs> sitting down to our Asian food, like talking Asian thing, you know, this whole thing. And it's like so ridiculous because at the end of the day, I'm like, really? Cause Claudia's, let's be honest here. She's Japanese. Like that's a whole other situation. Mm-hmm. And it is generationally, I'm like Mimi and my people definitely do not fuck with each other, you know? Like, and so, that that part is interesting that that is something that I would like hold dear, especially because she was also artistic, which was something that I really kind of um, related to. But then, you know, it's it's funny because there are these ways in which as I'm older and I have a lot more like autonomy and a lot more like breadth and like, let's be like, I mean, the internet really, I mean, this is where I feel old where I'm like, you guys, the internet is really good. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's such a gift because I would say that the, the books that where I really actually saw myself is, is something like Calvin and Hobbes. Like, I'm like, yes, I'm Calvin. Like, I'm so pissed. It's all about interiority. I have a really hard time interfacing with people and my parents. And like, you know, I would so much rather just stay in my own imagination. It's so much more fun. Like, and, you know, I was really like, kind of like rambunctious and like um, kind of a smart ass. And that was my secret self, even that, even though I couldn't really talk back to my parents, even though it was all like really respectful, that I think was my true heart. But it's like, you know, you get to a situation where I think the first year, if anyone had asked me like, oh, what are your role models? Or did you see yourself? I'd be like, oh yeah, I saw myself in these things. But now I'm like, um, I think Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah and like even the Korean piece it's like I know exactly what you mean Kat like it's like it's almost heartbreaking to me personally to be relegated to you know it's that notion of like what do you mean representation and erasure like y'all are good you have squid game you have this you have like you know and I'm just like that's like Korea though yeah 
Like Koreans are out here being like, I feel alienated by my own homogenous society. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it's it's really different. And so that is different. And that's why things like, you know, like um Steven Yun, like Minari, like stuff like that was important to me. That like, you know, that people are under are, are watching a grown woman cry because her mother brought her myochi because there's no like H Mart back in the day. <laughs> like <laughs> middle of america like that i was just like yes you should understand this about us you should not should but it's like a hectoring thing but like you know this is us this is everyone this is like like anytime a mom comes with like a huge potati from like your country like it's always gonna be about the food it's always gonna be pretty universal so like that stuff is really important but i i also super feel you on like harold and kumar like, like he didn't have to be he, it was, Korean. It was incidental. You know? Like yeah. first and foremost, he was the ill weed head. <laughs> yeah. And then he was hungry. And then this was his life, you know? Yeah. He totally. just lived his life. Like his Koreanness wasn't a defining factor ever in the movie. Yeah. I mean, it, it it affected parts of his identity and his personality as it should. He existed in the world with a Korean face, but like there was never a point where like Harold had to like justify his like immigrant parents like and his Korean upbringing like ever totally and also yeah. like there were no nerds in that, that movie like everyone was yeah. so cool <laughs> like that was <laughs> no I love that as a as a hero like I I do think that Harold and Kumar ultimately like is so subversive especially for yeah. when it came out so oh I sure. agree with you there <laughs> yeah like allowing two heroes, heroes to be like just hot-headed heroes of their yeah, own story totally. like, what yeah totally just and <laughs> like know. again like so like an example of like the subversion of like asian incompetence i was like yes mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my gosh yeah for sure um, <laughs> jumping off of that i feel like for a lot of people probably watching right now you guys are probably for them that like sort of like first introduction or not introduction but like probably gave a lot of people that moment of like seeing themselves on the page before, um, which I think is amazing. Um, but I was wondering if you could speak to like, did you have any hurdles when it came to getting these stories published or like getting like these specifically Korean stories um, or Korean representation published? Um, I, I, w I was in like a really rarefied position and I really um, acknowledge this a lot. Like I, you know, I, my books came out maybe like five years ago. And so that's really recent. Yeah. And it's, it's out, it's like exponential and like, just like the difference between what I know for a fact, like Jenny Han has experienced in her career is so different from mine, um, first and foremost, because she's so much more successful. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, no, like for her, it was it was still an issue. It was a conversation that there was an advocacy for like having a certain face on our covers, like things like that, things that just never, I like when I got here, that was not an issue for me. And I think part of that too, is that like, I was, I had been published before, like it wasn't, you know, I'd, 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 I'd been a reporter for like, 15 years and I I was on TV like all this stuff and so it it was just what I was doing and so there wasn't ever like a it is unusual to us that you are not writing about a Caucasian person <laughs> like that was like people didn't they couldn't come at me with that by the time I got here amazing um, yeah which is just uh, my my experience yeah I mean well I do think because I think for us to talk about where we started in publishing and how far like we've come it would be a disservice not to acknowledge the people who paved the way for us to start at the place we were able to start at so like obviously like jenny han or ellen o or maureen thu or linda supark you know all of those amazing korean authors who who came before and had to deal with so much more bs than we ever had to I think the only thing that I would say is that once there is one that's like huge, then everyone is the new version of that one, which I don't think is fair for anyone in that equation. I don't think it's fair for the person who trailblazed to be like, to bear the responsibility for like being the rubric 
for everyone yeah. who comes after. And I don't think it's fair for anyone of us to come after to have to be compared to that person because everyone's story is innately different because mm -hmm. it's our story. Like, even if I did, like, even if I wrote a story where a girl wrote love letters, you know, to her past loves, like, it, it will not be the same story as 12 Boys I Left Before because I don't have the same voice as Jenny Hanen or the same experiences as her. Um, so I do think that's a little bit hard because I, I think that it creates like a very, very limited view of what we're capable of doing as creators. And, and that I don't, I just don't think that that's very fair. Yeah. Um, and um, I think, I think it's currently, it's a weirdly double-edged sword because Korean pop culture is booming, booming. Um, and so it, people like get really excited about learning about Korean culture through our books, but I also feel a pressure with that too. Um, yeah. And so for my very first book that came out was right after BTS became huge. And everyone wanted to be like, oh, how BTS involved is this? And I was like, well, I mean, it's about a fox girl that eats people. Like, <laughs> so you're unless, like it's basically you know, the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I was like, unless like Jimin has like a, a secret other life that he, his, <laughs> his business, like I really don't think it's that related to anything that BTS does. But but at the same time, like you kind of are like, well, if people are going to actually pay attention to my book, if I talk about BTS a lot, then then is it wrong that am I doing myself a disservice to not do that? So that was like the most complicated part of the process for me. And also like people really wanted to treat my book like it was an encyclopedia about Korean mythology. And I was like, I made some of those stories up. Yeah. <laughs> it's fiction. It's I'm sorry, it's fiction. So like not all of those are actually based on true myths. Um, so those, I guess like those were the two most complicated parts of it for me. I mean, it's, that's the other thing that's so interesting. Like it, it's kind of that like hilarious, like morning show lead in version from it's like from BTS to kimchi <laughs> probiotics, it's like Korean <laughs> author, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, it, and it's like a totally unrelated other thing. And like, Truly, I mean, I remember when I was coming out, it was like very like circa Crazy Rich Asians too, which which was like amazing where I was just like, oh my God, this is like such, I mean, I personally love that movie. And so I was just like, this is like a great, but then it's also interesting because everyone's just like, this is like, you know, like so important to us. This is our Black Panther. And I kept being like, no, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's our best man holiday, but that's fine. Like, you know, it was like a very different move, but like, and so it really was, I remember like being rounded up a lot. Like these Korean or these crazy rich Asian authors, mm -hmm. you know, where it's just like suddenly you're a trend story. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm, I'm, am I like the Pantone color of the month? Like it just felt like so um, just tokenist and like very, I don't know. It was just weird. It was that that aspect of it is really strange. And also like that is it's painful. Like it's it's like just I don't know. It's like not the same. It doesn't take into account just like how much like loneliness and like how much like um, other rising there still is in our narrative. And we're supposed to like feel sort of bolstered by how well like our home country is doing, despite the fact that we still have really complicated feelings every time we go there, not only our own feelings towards our family, but literally the way they treat us. Cause like, they can smell it on me <laughs> that no. I'm like, like, you know, that I'm just not from there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that stuff is really heartbreaking. And it's, if you don't, it seems like to me, the more popular BTS becomes and the, the bigger like, k-dramas and like single in inferno and like all these things it's like the less space there is i feel sometimes to navigate the tension and like some of that alienation not only by the country that i'm living in but also the country that i, I come from and it's just like oh no it, it feels like a lot of like white people being like oh no that's not a thing and i'm just like i can't i i'm not gonna fight with you today <laughs> mm -hmm. but like you know this is a real thing yeah, no one likes to be boiled down. I mean, you, and the problem is, it's like people are like, but it's positive things. I like K-pop. And it's like, that's fine. 
but you're still simplifying my existence. And I don't care if it's because of a positive impression of, of this one aspect of my culture or not. I am much more, many more things than that. And I want to be afforded the right to prove that to you that many other people are afforded. Um, so I think that that's the issue because I think people that you become the villain by just asking someone to allow you to exist as yourself instead of fitting into the box that they've created for you. And it's like, when did I become the bad guy by merely asking you to like hear my story? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't understand why that's the case now. But like, it's always like the ill neg though. Cause it's mm -hmm. like, oh, you look just like na na na. And I'm just like, oh, that is so racist though. And they're like, but na 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 so pretty. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, how am I supposed to like, feel good about this it's like such erasure and it's such like I don't know it's just like really dehumanizing mm -hmm. it really is yeah. 100% um well the next question actually I feel like we've kind of already touched on it but I was gonna ask how have you seen Korean representation change over the years um and also how do you think the experience of being a Korean teen has changed from when you were one I mean, it has changed for sure. I mean, um, I, I think that I think the thing that's that's happened. It's interesting because sometimes I like do wonder if like this is how like Japanese Americans felt when like anime became huge, right? Or, like, how, <laughs> right? Or like how Chinese Americans felt when kung fu movies like Bruce Lee became really huge. I was like, is this how you felt? Like, I'm so sorry because it's so strange. Like to remember with a sh weird twisted nostalgia when no one knew where Korea was and I could just exist on my own and I didn't have to justify anything about my identity. Like it's weird to now be the focus of people. Um, and, and I think like Mary really did touch on it that like diaspora kids, like we have to exist in this place where we're proving ourselves to both sides of our identity. And it's exhausting. Like, it's, it's just so tiring to have to be, oh, no, 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 I'm American enough. I Here's my citizenship papers. Like, I know all the presidents or whatever, right? And then also be like, go to Korea and like the first time you open your mouth, they can hear your American accent and they like correct your pronunciation and then you feel like crap. So then you don't speak Korean, but then you get yelled at for not speaking Korean. Like, it's just like you can never win. Um, and, and, you know, it just it really it really stinks to like have so much attention on you because sometimes you do want to like just be in your own space and not have to be on all the time and like i fully acknowledge that i chose a career as an author and that does give me like certain a public persona like i'm not not taking responsibility for that but i also do know that like there's extra layers to it being bipoc and like writing about my culture so it's hard, it's hard, but I mean, I, I don't only want to talk about the negative things either. I do think there's positive. I, I think it's good that people know that Korea is its own country and, and stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tack that on at the end there. Exactly. <laughs> no, but Korea is a career, career. Korea is also like wild. Like, it is just, like, if you actually think about, like, how much this country has changed from, like, the, the 1988 Olympics mm -hmm. to now, it's bananas. Like, the GDP has grown so much. It's, like, on the world stage. It's doing so well. It's, like, you know, I have a, I have a friend who keeps saying that, like, K-pop should just be called pop because, like, at this point, it's, like, the other pop is like English speaking pop. And it's like, it's true. Like actually that is like numerically true. And the thing is, it's like, you know, I, I like that we are not just relegated to like terrible North Korea jokes or just like dog eating jokes. Like the fact that those are like actually like pretty widely shunned. I'm into that. Like I'm really for that. But the thing is, it's like, you know, we have this this country that is so ambitious and so like achievement minded and collectivist and like it's still a it's still like an 
oligopoly. Like the Chebo situation is just actually like a very specific thing. And so like, and you know, just like the debt ratio, like all of this stuff is like a very specific, just not, <laughs> I don't want to say anything. It's just like a very specific equation within our lifetimes. And so like, so much has changed. And I think that that's wonderful. But like with anything that changes that quickly, like I do think that there are enormous like growing pains and a lot of stretch marks. Like I'm just like, I think the interesting thing for me as someone who is an English speaking Korean person who lives like lives in America is, you know, the reason why I talk about mental health issues so much in like my life and my books and like all that stuff is because like my Korean is like that of a third grader, but it is interesting to me that I actually don't know at all. And it's really hard to just plug it into like the Google translate of like, Hey, listen, I am going to need to set a boundary with you. Like, this is how I'm feeling. And the story I'm telling myself is this. And like, you know, I feel this way and I feel unsafe in these circumstances. Like, I don't, like the fact that like, I don't know how to translate that is really interesting to me. And to me is like a huge opportunity. Like I'm not out here just like caping for like, oh, like I'm a missionary for mental illness, like mental health issues. And I'm gonna change, like, I'm not saying that like these aren't real concerns and that there aren't real resources there, but like, this is something that I am really interested in talking about specifically. Cause I do think that there is a lot more freedom to do that with an exactitude of language, um, just just sitting where I'm sitting, and I, I do I do think that that is really important. And you know, my my last book, Yoke, um, like eating disorders. I I really want to talk about that. Like I don't know what the eating disorder resources are in Korea. Like I don't, you know, I can only imagine as an ignorant ignorant person, like living far away from what it's like to actually live there. Like what the actual fallout and ramifications of like such a, I mean, I'm really vain. And I actually like consider it a quality of like being Korean <laughs> that I am so vain. And so like, I'm interested in like what that means culturally for women and especially young women as well. And like, and I'm not saying I'm gonna fix this or it's up to me. I'm just saying like, I'm curious. Like I really would love more data on this. Yeah. No, that's real. I feel like with that, it made, made me think about this one conversation I had with a relative where I was like, oh, yeah, I really want to go to Korea. And this was a few years ago. And she was like, you probably shouldn't because I'm plus size. Um, and like people will be mean to you. And I was like, I mean, my family probably will be. <laughs> but I think like I'm pretty obviously going to be there as a tourist. Um, but it is like a really hard conversation. And I do kind of know that intrinsically that like, I would not have survived um, that culture. And especially like even when I've had family members come over here and just like looking at that different um, sort of like that perception of like, like I have family members who would like, they just eat a shake every day and that's it. They just have like their shake and that's, um, but there's no real conversation around it. You know, like I watched this K-drama, I forget which one it was. And this girl was at a hospital and the guy was like, the doctor was like, um, oh, you're like weights down. She's like, oh, it's fine. I just have anorexia. And then like, but it was a joke and it was like, no big deal. Um, and so like, yeah, I do wonder about like how that conversation is going to continue to shift and also how it's going to impact as that like media obsession in the U.S. continues, like how that's also impacting um, Korean teens here. Um, and teens in general here in some ways. Oh, totally. Like the whole conspicuous consumption, like logo thing, like the whole singles inferno gate of like the fake designer, like accessories. Oh my like, gosh, yeah. That's, that, I mean, that stuff is like, it's, it's everyone can see it, you know, all that stuff. And like, again, like as a washed, like old ass person, I watch that and I'm a little bit like, oh, is this good for is this good for yeah. people? Is it not? How do I feel? Am I biased? Like, but, like whatever. But like, where are those conversations? I'm like very interested in them. Like, and I, I remember like, I'm, I was bulimic for, I mean, 
I still consider myself bulimic because I still have a lot of like thoughts where I'm just like, okay, inputs and then outputs. How does that work? Da da da. And that's just going to be the way my brain is. But like, oh my God, like being like a heavy person and going back to Korea in the summers and like just, I just remember like trying to buy like people insisting that like you should buy clothes and that this will fit you. And they're making a big deal out of it. And they're like, no, or like, or family members being like, no, 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 this is enormous. This will fit you. You know, just like all of this being so toxic. And like, again, because of that collectivist society, it's like, you know, you got a whole ass multi-generational family talking about you and like talking about your face. And like, I remember like, I never got like Sankapususu or like, anything done to me Mm -hmm. and so all of my especially my generation it was just like every all of my mother's friends would be like oh my god you your face is so refreshing and I'm just like wow (laughs) that's like when you call me healthy and I know what that means you know what I mean like Mm -hmm. I don't know that's all that stuff is really interesting well Korean people have a a bluntness that is (laughs) fairly universal that I find to be because my well I theorize it's because of that collectivist mindset of being like Korean people represent Korea as a whole so I have a right to have an opinion about how you look to me right now because you're representing us Mm -hmm. and like the fact that you could be walking down the street and some ajima can be like oh too fat or like uh, too tan or whatever like I I (laughs) would go to I grew up in Central Florida right and I played sports so I was tanner than normal. Like I wasn't like too tan in my mind. Like I didn't go tanning. I was naturally tan. And my grandmother would get so mad at me. And she would like give, she would like passive aggressively, like give me an umbrella every time I left the apartment. <laughs> and the first couple of times I was like, why is she getting, it's, it's sunny outside. Like why is she giving me an umbrella? She wanted, like, you know, wanted me to use it to like block the sun so I wouldn't get more tan. And it was just like, it's just like so insidious. I mean, and like also the colorism that is involved in, in that huge. mindset is like a huge. completely huge issue that like that is. And and I remember like earlier, um, like when we, we first started talking about this, Mary, you said, I don't know if you meant to say it, but under your breath, you're kind of like, I don't I don't know if I should say anything bad about Korea. And <laughs> but that's an issue with a lot of minority people in the West, like a lot of BIPOC being like, my culture is not perfect, but my culture is oppressed here. So Mm -hmm. like, what is the right thing to do to protect my culture and represent it here? Right. Especially because then we become the the one person spokesperson for the entire country, depending on like what we're doing on that panel. (laughs) Like, yeah, no, I mean, that's why I kind of love that. It's like, this is like entre new and it's like for us by us, because like, this kind of panel when it's done by like other people is like the most douche chill cringe, like just well-meaning, but just <laughs> ugh, like uncomfortable. But like, yeah, like our, our country is not close to ideal yeah. as any country comprised of human people. It, like, it's just, I don't know, but like, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, I mean, and also like as someone who's who's older, it's like anytime anyone's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to Korea. Everyone's always like, are you getting anything done? <laughs> like, and that's always just like implied. Yeah. And I think, yeah. And that that too. I'm just like, that certainly has a lot of effects on other things. For sure. Yeah. So the way they like just go so casually bring up plastic surgery to you when you're like 16 years old and you're like, what are you talking about double eyelid surgery? Totally. Like, totally. I don't, and like they say in a loving way too. So then you're even more thrown off. They're like, oh, you want me to give you this gift? This, how many loves you? <laughs> I'll make you an appointment. And you're like, oh, if you love me, or like, just, you, like give me food. Or, or you have like a freckle or like any, yeah. they're just like, let's go just get, just like get it done. Like, right yeah. Now. And I'm just like, okay, <laughs> relax. Mm-hmm. But it's like, it's like, it's like codependent enmeshment or something. They're just like all up in your business because they love yeah. you. But it's also like, Oh, uh, like I will have to go to nine types of ter- therapy for this. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. That is very real. Oh, kind of on that point, um, something that I feel like is almost seems intrinsic to that like Korean experience and Korean culture is this expectation of of suffering and silence. Um, 
and that's definitely something that I, I think both of you have, have, have really touched on in different ways in, in your works. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak to that kind of experience um, and especially writing that, um, writing that experience. Uh, <laughs> um, it's so it's definitely a thing that I've I experienced a lot growing up. I mean, I don't. My parents weren't necessarily trying to like silence me when I wanted to when I was like in pain or anything like that. I think it's just what they were used to, right? So they they grew up like in a society where you don't talk about mental health. Um, and that, that if you did go to therapy, you had to hide it because going to therapy implies something was wrong with you. Um, I just like different things like that, um, or like that, that we can overcome anything with enough, like hard work and practice, which feels very Korean to me too. Like Koreans, I mean like, okay, let's talk about K-pop. Like K-pop to me isn't K-pop because it's in Korean. It's K-pop because of the mindset behind what can make us or break a successful group. And a huge part of that is like having the fortitude to work hard enough for your dream, which implies a meritocracy, but obviously we know K-pop is not a meritocracy. Um, but it's this narrative that they really, really want us to believe in when it comes to this industry that in a lot of ways is representative of Korean pop culture. Um, and so I do think like that's a very Korean mindset of like the 10,000 hours of practice makes an expert kind of a thing. Um, and so when you're just not, you're just not good at something. So like I got diagnosed with ADHD as an adult. I didn't know I had it my whole entire childhood. So every time like I couldn't focus on something, the suggestion was always to just study more and practice more and try harder. And while I don't necessarily think that was a harmful thing to say to me, because I know what the intention was behind it, it was harmful in the sense that like, even when I practiced more and I still couldn't do it, it made me feel like a failure. Um, and if maybe my parents brought me to see a child psychiatrist or took me to see an expert, maybe I would have gotten diagnosed younger, but that's just not something we believed in. And I don't think my parents were bad parents because they didn't do that. It was just their culture. Um, so yeah, in a lot of ways, like it does permeate my work now because I do find it really hard to accept that this should be be an acceptable way to live your life. Like, I don't want to get too far into it, but my my dad had a lot of health problems and a lot of mental health problems and unfortunately he passed away. And I don't think it's necessarily because he didn't go to therapy, but you know, there's always something in the back of your mind where you're kind of like, if he got more help professionally and if he was able to accept that part of himself, would life have turned out different? You never know, but like, I do know that I asked him to go to therapy a lot. And my sister asked him to go to therapy a lot and he didn't because he didn't believe in it. So it's just, it's an issue that I think needs to be discussed about, discussed more in our culture for sure. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I like, I really, first of all, I totally identify with this, with this adult ADHD thing. I was like, I was diagnosed last year. <laughs> like, and it's really amazing. It's been so amazing to have some sort of detachment and understanding around why my brain does what it does. And then also within the moment be like, Oh, like this is my brain being my brain versus why am I such a useless, like dithery space cadet? Like, why can't I do this? Or like, what time is it? Oh my God, I'm late. Like all of this stuff. And so that's really fascinating. And I'm so glad I'm medicated and you know, I'm so glad I'm in, again, two types of therapy and two different 12-step groups, both for like um, dysfunctional families, but also an eating disorder. And like, it's so, the amount of support and help and like fellowship and just identification and compassion that I've received over the last like three and a half years when I've been in active recovery around all these things have been like amazing. And it's like, I'm like so much happier and I'm so much less anxious. And when I'm anxious, I'm like 
not trying to like vanquish it. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, I'm anxious. I'm anxious a lot. I'm just going to be anxious now, you know? And it's it's just been so gentle and like lovely. But you know, it's that's, that's the thing. It's like, you know, we get so many points for suffering, right? It's like, we're either suffering in silence or we're going buck. And like the freaking Han is just on a trillion. <laughs> <laughs> and like, it's just like that person should have done something about this earlier, you know, that thing. And that's real too. And that is innate and that feels Korean. Like, I feel like our suicide rate feels Korean. The, uh, you know, I was watching this documentary um, from this like philosopher, Han Pyeongchul, who was like talking about how on the um, bridges in Korea, instead of like, you are loved, here's an 800 number, or like pictures of family. It's pictures of food. Huh. They're just trying, that also feels Korean, where it's just like, they're just trying to give you just like one little impetus not to make a permanent decision mm -hmm. about a temporary situation. And it's like, I don't know, there's just so much that is so specific to us that is so mentally unwell. I'm just kind of like, you know, why isn't, like, why isn't it, it as just like presumptive as the color of our hair? Like we've been invaded so many hundreds of times without invading anyone else. Like we got stuff and it's ours and it's intergenerational <laughs> and we were occupied and my mother grew up in famine. Like, do is it a coincidence that I have an eating disorder? No, <laughs> like it's just, it's all a part of it. And I just wish that, you know, like my dad, like he has this incredibly fraught relationship with his father. And like, I didn't, my, my dad passed away a month ago and like, I was filling out his death certificate. And I was just like, I don't know my grandfather's name. And it's like, and like, even me saying it, like, I feel like I just said Voldemort where I'm just like, oh, like you can't say this. And I'm just like, but why? It's like a factual thing. It's not an indictment against anything. And like, like you were saying, this whole notion of meritocracy, work harder, like, like it's just like you know focus like all this stuff and it's like or in my case pray about it you know like in my in my family home and it's like I feel like oh okay so our personalities not to like be reductive like our whole thing is just like hey what corner us and like that but like to be reductive <laughs> we would be so good at therapy like if we had a show and it was all just like just about you know because like there's so much sincerity and then of course it's like a Korean variety show. So there'd be a panel and they would comment about their own therapy journeys and like talk about your therapy, like just to like normalize it. I think we'd be so good at it. Mm -hmm. Like, like literally when Squid Game came out, like I had friends texting me being like, are y'all all right? And I, like, <laughs> and I was just like, no, but like, this is also so accurate. Mm -hmm. This is so accurate on so many levels that I can't even explain to you. And so, yes, gavel, like this is my thing. I think we'd make a great show about like mental health and therapy. And I think it would be exciting and there could be prizes, but I'm just saying that like, <laughs> I wish it would be normalized. Yeah, I, I, well, I think Koreans are very observant people. I think so we'd observant. have to be, we'd had to be like, you know, we're not a resource rich country. Um, we're, we're bordered by really powerful, like, I'm just going to say it, greedy countries who wanted more and used us to get it. And so like, we were like, what do we, else do we have? We have our minds. Right. Yeah. And so we had to develop that. And, you know, I mean, I think that's why Korean entertainment is, is so, uh, is so good. I mean, and you already said it too, Mary, is that like, like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I remember going to Korea as a kid and it's so different. Like infrastructure totally. is so different than it is now. I have stories that be like, I remember back in the day in Korea and I was like, why do I have stories like that? Because Korea is literally Change. changed by like exponentially grown since like the 90s even. And like I, people don't know that like even like 25 years ago, we were like pretty much authoritarian society. We had presidents, we had elections but they weren't free and fair elections and and like we had to fight for that and and so so like where korea is now is actually a huge accomplishment like where our entertainment industry is now is like you don't even know where we were 20 years ago so and that is all owed to 
the ingenuity and the like mind of Koreans. Like, I'm sorry, I have Korean pride. I do really think that we've come a really long way and I'm very oh. proud of that. Yeah. Same, we're wily and we're scammers. We like, are. <laughs> like, it's amazing. I'm yeah. super proud of us. But like, again, that's, you know, you know, it's like equal and opposite. Like that's coming from somewhere. And definitely mm -hmm. I'm like, are we all right? Like, is this gonna be okay? Like, and, but I don't know, like, and also we're so emo. Like talk an angry Korean and we'll burst into tears. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, it's and and that, but even that too, it's like did you did you ever like did your parents ever say like when you're crying, they're like duk duk and they're getting you to stop crying because they can't take it? Oh. And, and I'm just like, oh, God, like no wonder we're so repressed. Like our parents, <laughs> you know, I <laughs> You know, I could be like, I'm unhappy. And my parents would be like, what did I ever do to you? You're so ungrateful. <laughs> and I'm just like, why is it like this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I used to, I used to like, um, I don't know where it came from, to be fair. But I, I had to like confirm with my parents multiple times as a kid that they actually loved me. Like, <laughs> and my mom was so I would never confused. ask. Oh, my God. My mom was, and my mom, bless her heart, like, so confused. Where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? And, like, I don't know, like, where it was coming from. Like, I, I don't blame them. But I do think, like, there is, like, this kind of emotional withholding by, like, especially older generations in Korea. Like, and, and I've learned as I grew up, like, what the markers are. Like, this, my, like, my harmony, like, patting me on the butt is equivalent to her giving me the biggest hug and kissing me on the cheek because that mm -hmm. means, means I did a good job. So I'm always like, oh, I did the dishes. And I'm just like, you know, pat on the butt. <laughs> like, you know, like, oh, like, I, I did, did a good job. Like, I did a good job. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, mm -hmm. like, sometimes weird pinches. I'm just like, yeah. oh. Weird pinches. Yeah. Or like, if she peels, if she peels a tangerine for me. Yeah. Oh my God, she loves me so much that day. It's such a and they never And they never take a tax or take a bite first. They're just like, mm, no. And you're like, you all right. First. Yeah, 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 yeah. With a weird two prong tiny fork. You're the like, tiniest cool. forks in the world. You're like, where do you keep these when you're not using them? Like, I don't know. Totally. Um, do, do we have time for questions? Sorry, I'm like, I'm always, of course, I'm paranoid about time. <laughs> No, you're totally fine. Yeah, if anybody in the chat um, wants to put some questions as we get through, I think we have like one or two more questions that we had prepped. Um, and we'll hop to those in a sec. We also have like a nice little spammer. <laughs> Chloe's oh, getting good. rid of. She's on it. Um, I did kind of have a tangent on something that you mentioned, Mary. Um, like you mentioned Squid Games and sort of like this growth of media. Something that I've noticed, um, and this is sort of very anecdotal, is that when it comes to the Korean media that does seem to like gain really huge popularity in the US, it is all really sad. Um, but there is like a lot of happy, like like cute Korean media too. Um, yeah. And I don't know, I like, do you guys have thoughts on that um, and and why you think that might be? I mean, I love being Korean. Like, we're so metal. Yeah. Like, there's never a gray. There's never half-assed. It's like, I mean, the thing that we were no known for before this was revenge. Like, every revenge movie was like, the you old know, boy? like, old boy, like, yeah. Lady Vengeance. Like, all of it. Like, that was our thing. It was all like, it's a long con, but I will get you. You know what yeah. I mean? That was like mm -hmm. our personality. And now it's more like, murder game show <laughs> or like just like unbelievable class like you know distress mm -hmm. but like I don't know like I I mean I love being Korean like and that's the other part about the mental health part that I'm like this makes no sense because like clearly we're lunatics <laughs> yeah. like we're mm -hmm. all like so intense and so like I I do I actually like things like I mean Parasite was such an important movie for me mm -hmm. um, it's it's so beautiful it's the tidiest story it just it, I mean that just won wins like all the awards of my heart um and I do like that it's not just a glossy like eight pack Dior and that's our personality like I do think that it's interesting and like compelling and beguiling that the sort of 
that our personality within the media is so deranged. Like I, that, <laughs> I really see myself in that. <laughs> <laughs> you feel so represented by Parasite specifically. <laughs> totally. um, Tag yourself. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I, the thing is though, I do think the issue that like the, the thing, the reason why I'm, I don't, I have noticed this Monica, that like a lot of the things that are most popular in the West are like, our most intense things. Um, but I don't, I, I think those things deserve everything that they have. I think mm -hmm. Parasite and Squid Game and Old Boy and all that stuff deserves the attention that they have. I think the issue comes with that. There's other things that also deserve recognition, but do not get it. And that's not an issue with, with Korea not producing it. Yeah. Okay. It's an issue with what, the West deems worthy of, of their attention span. And mm -hmm. I want I mean, I have theories about it too. Like I have theories that like Koreans, like don't shy away from things that make people really uncomfortable. Cause like Parasite is a movie that's supposed to make you uncomfortable. Um, like, so, so I think that like, but Parasite isn't necessarily an outlier when it comes to Korean film. There's a lot of Korean films that like also touch on things mm -hmm. that aren't easy to talk about, but, they go there and like people, someone once said to me, they're like, oh, I guess like zombies are back, but only in Korea. And I was like, that's because Koreans aren't afraid of making zombies like do like the worst things a zombie can do. Like, <laughs> like why was these like whitewash, like not whitewash, yeah. but like, you know, like PG zombies, like, you know, yeah, <laughs> like, no, we're, we go, we go far. Like if Koreans are going to do it, we're going to do it all the way. Um, so, so I do, I do love that about our mentality as a society. Um, but I agree too, that there's like happy things. And I think this kind of is in line with a lot of discussions that are had in Kidlet, right? Where you're like, buy books by BIPOC, but not just the ones about our pain and not just issue books, right? Like those books are important. Don't stop buying those, but like also let us be dynamic. Let us also have joy books. Let us also have magic let us also not have to justify it and be stoners or whatever um i so i think that the issue is that the west is missing pieces of the puzzle i think korea is doing fine yeah like in terms of creating media. <laughs> yeah. totally um, i mean but, yeah go oh, ahead. sorry no sorry. go ahead no no no. i was just thinking our our zombies really are better you know what i mean like because <laughs> oh for a long time it was just like slow zombie Mm -hmm. Fast zombie. These are the flavors of the zombies. Meanwhile, <laughs> our zombies are on trains. <laughs> They're yeah, like... they literally, they literally like create the visual of the train of the zombies spilling over each other. In oh my god, one. so good! Oh, um, just like such art, unbelievable. Of that. Yeah, totally. Uh huh. Uh, okay, I think we have time for maybe like two more questions. Okay. So I wanted to ask. This is just my personal curiosity. I just want to know which, what's your favorite book that you've both written? Of ours? And, yeah, and why. Go ahead. <laughs> choose oh, choose one this. baby first. Yeah, go. <laughs> choose a favorite baby. Um, this is really hard because I love, I love my children for different reasons. I feel like I am supposed to say the next one so that people buy it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I will say that I, I definitely think I've developed as a writer. I don't think I've gotten better necessarily. I hate that concept, become a better writer. What does that even mean? Um, but I definitely like my, I, I personally like the author I am becoming more and more mm. with each new project. And that's the only thing I can judge it by but, while still retaining my mental health. Right. So I do really love K prom, once upon a K prom because I do think that I did things in it that still make me happy right now. Um, and I don't know if that's because like, I, you know, I, I'm like burnt out on the other, on talking about the other books or not. Um, I just really, I really liked that I was, it's the first time I wrote a diaspora Korean character because my other two books were set in Korea as Koreans. And I really, for those books, wanted to write Koreans that their Korean identity wasn't an issue for them. 
And it was kind of self-therapy because migraine identity has always been an issue for me. I'm still discovering it to this day. Like there's certain things like I, I didn't grow up calling my sister Anni. I started doing it later in life and I do it now. And it's more, it's natural for us both. But we had a discussion when she's like, when you first started doing it, it was weird to me. So we didn't grow up like that. But like, it doesn't, you have a right to call me Anni if you want to. You don't have less ownership over that label because you started doing it later in life than when we, since we were born. Um, and so I've had to come term, to terms with whether I'm allowed to use Korean things about my identity. Like, like if I have permission to do that, who gives that permission? So I wrote Wicked Fox and Vicious Spirits because they don't ever have to ask permission to be Korean. But then I was like, it would be nice to discuss my diaspora identity. And I will write a book about that now. So it holds a special place in my heart once upon a Cape Brown because there are certain issues that I've had to deal with growing up, Korean American, that I was able to talk about in that book. And also K-pop, you know, cute boys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say that it is probably my recent book that's right here. Just came out. This oh, week. Yeah, I saw that. Um, Congratulations. Yeah, and I, I didn't get to tour it um when the when the hardback came out. And so that was really heartbreaking because I really do think it is my favorite book. It was so painful to write. It chronicles my own struggles with um an eating disorder and just this like really, really sad and corrosive and quietly toxic notion that if I looked a certain way that that the world would treat me differently. And, you know, it's about two sisters who don't get along, who change their um, identities because the older one has cancer and doesn't have health insurance and uses the younger one's cancer. But I mean, use, uses the younger one's health insurance that she has through school but they hate each other. And so it's just like weird lie that like brings them together. And like, you know, it was, it was a really personal book because um, my mom was diagnosed with cancer when I was writing it. And so that was really, really painful and like really difficult and sort of figuring out the feelings of that was like really therapeutic to me in a lot of ways, like in ways that I was prepared for because of my eating disorder stuff, but then ways that I wasn't prepared for because it kind of started feeling like magical realism where I was just like, oh no, if it if this happens in the book, what's gonna happen in real, you know, just that thing where I was like in that movie version of like me writing the book. Um, and then, you know, and then actually, you know, I was just saying that my dad died because my dad was diagnosed with ALS like two months after my mother was diagnosed with cancer and it was all within this book. And so, it talks about family a lot and like you know like you were saying about writing about the diaspora and how you know even just your face looks different when you're talking about it this is like the secret smile of like like i like it's almost like a gift you give yourself you know you're this like this telescoping version of you where all of the versions of you sort of like meet and like the older one what you're saying about you know you like yourself as an author now i think is like so profound and i i'm I definitely share in that experience where like, I have so much more kindness towards myself and I have so much more compassion towards my characters. And like, I love sending my characters to like my younger self and be like, you know, fly, you know, it's, and it's, it's all just like the same thing because what really is time, like what really is anything. And so, you know, that I love that and I, I take it so seriously. And I've had a lot of people talk about um, the trigger warning in the front about like how this was an emotionally expensive story to both read and produce. And like people have told me when I, at signings, like when the one time I had a signing outdoors when they were just like, hey, like I also have eating disorder. And like that stuff really is so important to me because like we're, like we're all here for such a short time and we all have like our agendas and we all have like what we want to get done and how we want to be seen and everything like that. But it's like, ultimately I'm just like, it just, it, it doesn't matter. So it's really, if you can like plant it mattering in someone and just 
however many of those experiences you had to have, like each one is like so valuable. Like it just, it didn't exist and now it exists. And like, that's like all you can really ask for. And like, I think books are magical. I think that writing in a pandemic was so scary because you're like, what version of reality am I even talking about? And like, I don't know, it's so healing. Like, I don't know how to process unless I'm doing it within a book. And so I'm really grateful that I'm so glad I get to do this. That's yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I will, I have to say, I'm very, very thankful for your books because they've meant a lot to me. And honestly, hearing you guys talk, I've actually had to try to stop myself from crying <laughs> because I just feel so like, you know, safe and seen. And that's how I feel when I read your books. So I'm just very thankful for this discussion right now. Yeah. I want to thank you both so much for your generosity and both your time and your, um, and your openness during this conversation. Cause it's, yeah, I feel very much the same way as Chloe. Yeah. And I think people in the comments have also said they can relate to a lot of the things. So it's just, this has been very nice. <laughs> thank you for yeah. the invitation. And Kat, I can't wait for your book. That sounds so amazing. I'm so happy. Yeah. Um, yes. Maybe we'll have we... in-person events. By yeah. Then. Oh my God. I know. Like <laughs> things, events. Like, Should we do a quick little shout out though? Um, so Mary's Yolk currently out in paperback now. Yes. <laughs> everywhere books are sold. Um, and Kat, um, what day is your book come out? May? May 17th. Once Upon okay. a Paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It'll be Very nice weather. So. How do you feel? <laughs> Uh, no. It's weird, right? Yeah, no, sure, sure. You're right on, you're right on track. <laughs> right, yeah, I'm, I'm at like the, what is it, like the seven stages of releasing a book? Yeah. Like, you know, excitement, mania, numbness is where I am French now. fries. Yeah. yeah, like, like sporadic emotional emotions for no reason. Um, yeah, just, you know, all the great, all the great parts of it. But it's, I mean... It'll be warm out. It'll be spring. Yeah. Like it's gonna, like, like it's gonna be great. It's, it's gonna be thank amazing. You. Yeah. Thank you. This is thank you for giving me this pep talk. <laughs> Didn't know I was gonna get this, but this is such a nice bonus. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all um, for your time and for yeah. just the space and like the vibes yeah. and like yeah. Um, yeah, and for doing everything that both of you do. I mean, yeah, like, for authors real. owe so much to bloggers and reviewers, and you guys. I've, I've admired your platforms for a really long time and I've always been like so excited to see these two prominent Korean book booktubers, book bloggers. I don't know what <laughs> preference you have for content creator name, but like you guys are just blazing trails and love to have you in the community. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And yeah, thanks people. to all the commenters and the people yeah. who like joined in. It was so nice. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, this was amazing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, obviously, Mary and Kat. And yeah, should we talk about um, our next live show? Monica? Oh, right. Yes. So our next live show is tomorrow, same time. Um, we'll be over on my channel. Um, very excited. Um, the topic for that one is infusing Korean mythology and history into YA. And we'll be joined by Axio and Jun Her. So hope to see you here. Yay. Bye. 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 Bye.